I'd like to thank you all for being here today and I uh, would like to welcome you to this discussion of the Sprat Safe Practices process for building a rope access permit. Uh, I wanted to do this webinar because I, I felt like it's a, a really important facet of how we approach rope access in the United States as opposed to in other places and also because as we develop rope access further in the United States and get greater regulatory acceptance of rope access, it's incredibly important that we really use the permit process in the way that it is designed um, so, that, so that we maintain the safety record that rope access is incredibly <laughs> famous for. So, um, so that's kind of why we're talking about that today. And I'm going to go through several slides and, and kind of some examples and some, some uh, overviews of how we use the permit process, what the permit contains, why it contains the things that it does. But if you have any questions, please, as Jess said earlier, go ahead and type those into your comment section or your chat section of your, uh, your communication box in the GoToWebinar page there. And we'll try to get those questions answered as well, because as you probably know, anything you have to ask is probably more important than what I was going to say anyway. So let's get started. Rope access, as uh, I'm sure you're probably already aware, uh, is, is something that occurs around the world and, and is uh, accepted to varying degrees in different parts of the world. But understanding where rope access kind of came from is part of understanding where we're going and why we do things the way we do. There are several rope access organizations around the world other than SPRAT. Uh, you're probably familiar with IRATA in the UK. Uh, there's SOFT in Norway, IRAA in Australia, FISAT in Germany, SARA in South Africa, and actually several others that aren't listed here. Many of these organizations do certifications for technicians just as SPRAT does. Um, but most of these organizations began specifically to address a type of work that was being done in that part of the world for those, um, for those users. And I'll use IRATA as an example because they're at the top of the list. Um, IRATA was developed in the UK primarily for use by people who were doing offshore work on oil rigs. And so the methods and the techniques and the philosophies and everything that, that they adopted sort of came from that perspective. It came from the perspective of guys who are out in the North Sea wearing big old bulky um, survival suits and PFDs and, and blowing around in, in the cold and ice and working on very complex uh, structures in the North Sea. We're not in that situation in the United States. And because of that, our processes and concepts and thoughts and, and techniques have developed just a little bit differently. In the, rope, in the United States, we kind of consider rope access to be any technique uh, by which access is gained to buildings, structures, geological features uh, by means of ropes. And we apply it to pretty much all cases where ropes are used as the primary means of support, where ropes are used as the means of primary protection in addition to support, so we're talking two ropes here, and where people descend or ascend on a rope or traverse along a horizontal rope. So that's kind of the, the baseline that we're starting from in the United States. In the United States, we don't have a, well, we do have a lot of oil rigs, but that's not all we have. We have a really, really big, diverse country with lots of different problems and, and situations to resolve. Uh, that, that things like scaffolds and platforms and, and aerial lifts don't necessarily work for. And you can see a few of those examples on this slide. Um, we have rope access used in construction and maintenance processes. Um, the uh, engineering inspections is, is a very common use of rope access. We use it in, in backcountry environments uh, so, as well as in, in urban and structural environments. We use it in confined spaces. So rope access isn't just a specific set of tools and a specific um, uh, method of techniques that always fits every situation. The beauty of rope access is that it fits a variety of situations. And that is exactly why we don't prescribe very specific, this is the descender you have to use. This is the method or technique that you have to use. We try to teach concepts and train the technicians to uh, be able to make wise decisions within the scope of their education. 
So SPRAT was developed in the United States. The Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians was developed in the United States as a membership organization. As a membership organization, it's a little bit different from some of the rope, other rope access organizations in the world. We're a membership organization representing the worker. Um, and if you are a SPRAT member, if you are an individual, you can sign up to be a SPRAT member on your own. You don't need an employer. Other rope access organizations are focused around the employer, and they represent the employer. The employer is the member. Uh, the employer, the, the, the organization serves the employer. The primary focus of the organization is the employer's needs. So, so SPRAT is a little bit unique in that regard. We develop voluntary consensus standards. Uh, voluntary consensus standards means that everybody doesn't necessarily 100% uh, agree, but we certainly take inputs from everybody, and uh, a majority of those people do have to agree in order for one of the standards to go through. And we use written as well as practical tests to certify individuals. Most people who are becoming SPRAT certified take at least a 40-hour certification course, uh, at the end of which they're audited by an independent evaluator. And that independent evaluator has to be someone who didn't train them, they didn't teach them, and who they don't work for. So there's the, the person who's, who's approving their techniques and who is approving their certification is somebody who doesn't necessarily have a dog in the hunt as to whether or not they pass or not. So rope access is a combination of training, certification, and experience. And with all that in mind, we try to pre-plan every job using the permit process. The permit process was actually uh, something that we created to acknowledge and accommodate the concept that there's different ways of doing things, and there's different equipment for doing things. Um, and the different work environments kind of dictate which equipment and techniques might ought to be used in that situation. And I know I have some, my, uh, sorry, it's not working here. Sorry about that. Um, the permit process also requires the work planner to consider all aspects of the work to be done. So a permit is not a job safety analysis or a job hazard analysis. A permit includes a job safety analysis, but it goes far beyond the job safety analysis. And finally, the permit process relies on the depth of experience and the professionalism of the supervisor and the personnel. So the people who are preparing the permit really have to be experienced and understand just exactly what it is they're doing. Now, that's not to say that, that you have to do a, a separate permit for every single job you do. This, you can use the same permit for different jobs where the work to be done is essentially the same. So what does a rope access permit look like? Well, it looks kind of like one of these. Um, it's basically a written statement that's prepared by the employer that describes everything about that job. Um, and it, it doesn't have to look exactly like the one that you see on your screen here. This is just an example. And usually a rope access permit will have several pages, including drawings um, and diagrams of the work to be done, as well as full descriptions of, of various things. The rope access permit. Um, was designed to be consistent with other OSHA practices, such as the permit process in construction, confined space, and longshoring. Uh, the permit process goes, as I said before, far beyond the typical job safety analysis or job hazard analysis, although that is part of the process. And the permit process is, is something that OSHA can use, the industry understands, and can fit easily in with the safe practices that SPRAT has, has developed. In order to create a, a uh, permit for rope access work, the things that you need to consider include the rope access methods to be used for the proposed work. As we talked about earlier, there's different ways of accomplishing a given task. And so identifying which methods will be used for this particular job is part of the, uh, the permit. In addition, the members of the work team should be identified by name and specifically identifying their duties. That helps to ensure that the people who are doing a particular duty are actually qualified and capable of performing that work. 
the Rope Access Supervisor is actually left to assess the individual team member's suitability for the work. So just because somebody is a level two or a level three uh, technician doesn't necessarily mean that they've worked in that environment before or that they're, um, they're really fit for a given job. So that, that's up to the Rope Access Supervisor who should have a depth of experience not just in Rope Access but in all aspects of fall protection. In addition, we like to list the rope access equipment that's to be used for the work to be performed. Um, and again, we try not to be too terribly generic. You know, you could say, well, we're going to use a descender. We probably know we're going to use a descender. But which descender are we going to use? And, and why did we choose that one? And, and, what are the, and, and, and knowing which equipment is going to be used allows the rope access technician to look at the work plan and to assess whether or not he's ready for that type of job or whether maybe he needs a little bit of training uh, because you're using a different type of descender or ascender or rope grab, for example. We also list the hazards that are associated with the work, and that is the JSA, or the Job Hazard Analysis, uh, and that's a, a very important part of the process. We list the appropriate PPE to be used. If you need steel-toed shoes, if you need a, a welding glove or a certain type of um, protection, this is the place to list it. So we list not just the rope access equipment that's specific to the access part of the job, but we talk about how that's going to interface and interact with the rest of the equipment that's used on the job. Remember, the rope access is really just the, the bus you use to get to work. The job to be done is not the rope access itself. It's just how you're getting there. We list provisions providing security to the anchor. Uh, as you're probably aware, anchors are a, a long-standing problem in, in most types of work at height, and especially in the, the scaffold uh, world, you find that anchor failures are, are uh, much more common than we would like for them to be. And so we are highly sensitive to anchors because we, we have a pretty good anchor safety history within Sprat, and we'd like to keep it that way. So we list provisions provi for providing security to the anchor, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. We also list public safety provisions. What kinds of uh, protection do we need for the public? Are you working overhead? Uh, do you have other, other people working around you? Uh, do we need to provide some sort of safety for other people who aren't necessarily part of your job? And then, of course, we always list the rescue service and some methodology for summoning the, uh, the rescue service. So let's go through these one by one and just kind of talk about what they include and what it means. <clears throat> The first thing is to list the rope access methods to be used for the proposed work. What does this mean? Well, it means evaluating the equipment that we're going to use for, for the proposed work. We talk about, uh, as I said, what kind of descender we might use, uh, whether we're going to be equipped with uh, a full-on ascending rig that's going to make it really easy for us to ascend, or whether we're going to have just a basic ascending rig for moving short distances. We talk about our primary lines and our safety lines. What material are they made of? Are they nylon? Are they polyester? Why? Uh, do you need any force absorption in the system? Uh, where are our anchorages, and how are those set up? The key aspect of, of the primary and secondary line is that the failure of any one point in the system should not result in catastrophic failure. So you should be able to have a failure at any one point in the system, and it cannot result in catastrophic failure. When you're setting up your rope access system, when you're drawing your picture in your, your permit, um, this is one of the things, one of the key things that you should keep in mind. In the rope access methods, we also want to take into consideration the access zone and the hazard zone. The access zone is where the worker gets on rope. The hazard zone is where the worker and or anyone else might be in danger, uh, even if they're, they're not in fall danger. Maybe they're in danger of something dropping on their heads. So those are the things that we need to identify as we're considering which methods we're going to be using. And then the methods for the technician, the worker, the attendant, the, the methods for different people on that job may differ from one another. And this is the place to take that into consideration as well. As I said before, uh, because of the pl way that, that rope access has evolved in the United States, SPRAT really takes into consideration a lot of different types of works, work, a lot of different types of environments. And so in order to accommodate that, we need to be accepting of different methodologies, different equipment um, that are within the scope of the technician's training. 
We also want to list the members of the work team by name, and we're identifying each of their specific duties, and that helps them understand their expectations as well as makes us, make sure that we understand uh, as supervisors what their, their training level is and whether they're capable of doing uh, exactly what it is we've assigned them to do. The roles and responsibilities of supervisor, technician, and worker, we, we really kind of tried to originally design that to correspond with work practices that OSHA is already familiar with, where the authorized person is the person who uh, has the author authorization to do work. The supervisor is a person who oversees work. Uh, and the attendant is somebody who kind of observes to, to make sure that the work is being done safely and, and, uh, and the management is done by a qualified person. So we try to align everything kind of with the qualified, competent, and authorized mindset uh, within OSHA. So if a, a qualified person is overseeing and approving everything and the competent person is setting up the job and the competent or authorized person is always doing the work, then we can help ensure that the right people have the right training before they get out there in the hazard, uh, hazardous situation. A qualified person, uh, specifically as it relates to rope access, the qualified person is the one who should designate the access hazard and safe zones. They're the person who uh, really has the overall knowledge of fall protection beyond that of just rope access. They understand the training that's necessary for this type of job, for whatever type of job is being performed. And they need to ensure that the personnel are suitable, not just from a rope access perspective, but from the type of work to be done perspective. Uh, is the person qualified in, in wel welding or non-destructive testing or, or whatever else needs to be done on that job? Um, the qualified person is responsible for making sure that the, the work is properly supervised and monitored. That doesn't necessarily mean that the qualified person is standing out there supervising and monitoring himself. It just means that the qualified person is making sure that somebody is there to, supervisor, uh, to supervise and to monitor the work. The qualified person documents the employee work experience, prepares the access permit, this thing that we're talking about. Uh, the qualified person determines that conditions are safe for online work. Some people have a little concern with wind, as we all know. Uh, wind is not nearly as much of a problem with, with rope access as, as it is for, for example, uh, powered platforms or scaffolds or stages. But, but still, there is some wind consideration. There's weather considerations. Uh, so so de determining those conditions are safe is the job of the, the supervisor or, the, or is the job of the qualified person. PPE is the job of the qualified person, and as is the uh, insurance that the rescue service is available and prepared for as well. So what's the competent person? The competent person is your primary guy on the job. He's the, the main person who's trained and certified to do the work. He understands how to use the equipment. He may not re understand every little aspect of all the regulations and how they fit together, uh, but he can do what he's told. He can, do, he can perform pretty much any aspect of the rope access work that the qualified person asks him to do. He can recognize and mitigate any hazards that, that might come up during the course of the work, and he can take care of those access and hazard zones to keep people from getting hurt while he's in them. Uh, he can perform self-rescue, he can utilize PPE, check everybody else's PPE, and he can supervise everybody uh, while the job is going on. So that's your competent person. And then your authorized person is basically, uh, no disrespect intended, your dope on the rope. He's the guy who's properly trained. He knows, he knows how to do the job. That might be the only job he knows how to do. Uh, and he does have to work under the supervision and discretion of the technician or the competent person. Uh, but he's authorized. He has just enough training to get out there and, and do the work safely and efficiently and not get himself in trouble. Equipment is a really important part of, of what we do and what we use, and so we try to make sure that that gets list, listed in the uh, permit process. We make sure that the equipment is not only suited to the task at hand, but it's also intended for the life safety application that we're putting it to. Now, that sounds a little bit silly. Um, why, do we, why do we ensure that it's intended for life safety? Because isn't all of this equipment intended for life safety? Well, yeah, it is for the most part, but you'll find in, in fall protection um, and in, in types of fall protection where people might have a little less training than they do for rope access, um, you might find that the backup ropes that are being used are not necessarily what we would normally refer to as life safety ropes as certified by the Cordage Institute or as tested to Cordage Institute standards. 
They might be uh, simply commodity ropes or things like that. We want to make sure that those kinds of pieces of equipment, even though they might be on a job site, we want to make sure that they don't sneak onto the, the rope access job. And then we want to make sure that the equipment is certified to appropriate standards. This is kind of a tough one because not all uh, standards that are necessarily used in our regulatory environment really apply to rope access. And as an example, again, I'll, I'll bring up the fall protection regulations, uh, which, which really kind of lean towards ANSI standards. They sort of give a preference to ANSI certified equipment. And really, when you're doing rope access work, some of the gear uh, harnesses, for example, for, for typical fall arrest and fall protection, don't necessarily have a frontal attachment point. So they might not be util able to be utilized in rope access. Uh, the fall arrest rope grabs might not be uh, easy to get on and off the rope or easy to do transitions with, which makes some of those fall arrest rope grabs not sufficient for rope access work. So we have to com combine the concepts of making sure the equipment is certified to appropriate standards, but also suited for the task at hand. So uh, again, this is just kind of a, a point that's made in the safe practices document, uh, that even though our regulatory environment kind of prefers equipment that's certified to a fall protection standard, uh, not all of this equipment is necessarily viable or usable for rope access. So in addition and or instead of some of the ANSI standards, uh, equipment used in rope access might meet a, a CE standard, which is a European standard, which doesn't really apply in the United States, but at least it gives you some level of, of knowledge. It might meet an ASTM equipment standard or a Cordage Institute or an NFPA standard. Uh, the, the key is that it meets a standard that applies to the type of, of use that that piece of equipment might see in that job. So then we move on to the hazards associated with, with the job. Uh, the hazards associated with rope access work um, can be kind of varied, but, <clears throat> but these include the selection of our employees and certification of our employer, employees. Hazards might include the ability of the suspended person to safely use the equipment or, or the materials that he's supposed to work with that day. For example, if you're working on rope, um, you might want to take extra precautions with, with hot materials or with wet environment or uh, other kinds of, of equipment that might be on the site. We also want to take into consideration uh, some of the other access alternatives. It, would it be better to use a swing stage in, for this job? Would it be better to use a ladder for this job? Would it be better to use a bucket truck for this job? Sometimes the answer to those questions is yes. And so this is the time to think about that and to make sure that, that rope access really is the best choice for this particular job. We also want to consider the work that we're doing and whether it might drop something on somebody's head uh, or whether it might create a, a hazard for our own equipment or system. And just how long are we going to be hanging there on rope, especially if you're hanging for long periods of time? Maybe rope access isn't the, the way to do this job. So um, rope access really has a, a, an advantage in being easy in, easy out, low impact on the environment, low impact on the structure that you're working on. Uh, but if you're going to be there for days on end, maybe, maybe putting a scaffold up is the best way to handle this particular job. And then, again, along with the hazards, what if one of those hazards does occur? What, you look at your worst case scenarios and, and think about, if, if this does happen, what am I going to do? What is the team going to do? What's our response going to be? We also want to list our appropriate PPE. Um, and PPE is, is kind of a, a long-standing debate um, because different environments, different types of industries, different types of workers have different priorities. Um, for example, in some industries, people don't consider it necessary to wear helmets. Rope access technicians will almost always wear a helmet unless that helmet might create a greater hazard uh, than, it's, than it's protecting against. But, but in most cases, a rope access technician will wear a helmet, whereas in some controlled descent type situations, you might find that, that the person won't wear a helmet. Um, what kinds of helmets do you wear? Do you wear a, you know, making sure that, that in rope access you're wearing a, a helmet that's going to stay on your head when, it, when you fall or if you fall, uh, not necessarily a construction helmet that's just going to fall right off. Uh, your personal protective equipment, 
uh, might include a, a seat board, and this is a place to, to differentiate between seat boards and, and maybe um, uh, seat boards that are, are built into bosun's chairs. And the, the bosun's chair is really a pre-rigged three-to-one system. It's a completely different device than a, than a comfort seat or a, a, a chair. Uh, but this is something that, that you need to, to take into consideration at your PPE level. Um, if you're sitting in a chair, it's a lot more comfortable for long periods of time than just hanging in a harness. Providing security to, to the anchors uh, is something that I mentioned earlier that we really want to pay attention to. Not only do we want to make sure that the anchor itself is secure and safe and exceeds the strength that we really need, we want to make sure that we're rigging properly. We don't want big angles in our systems. Uh, we want back ties wherever necessary and wherever appropriate. Uh, and if other people have access to, this is a roof, for example, that I happen to stumble across these particular anchors, and they weren't mine. They were someone else's. And they were just there. There was no one there to protect them. There was no barrier around them um, in this particular case. And so, so making sure that there's safety uh, provisions for those anchors so nobody can mess with them is a really important part of, of the anchor process. Public safety provisions are also important. Um, if you're working over traffic, over people, uh, we may want to make sure that you've got some hazard zones established and, and marked, and make sure maybe you maybe you even have somebody planted uh, to to warn people away from from a hazardous situation, because public public doesn't necessarily look up and know that you're there. So, making sure that uh, that public safety is accounted for is is part of our rope access permit. And then this is a big one. Uh, we want to make sure that we know who the res rescue service is and how we're going to get a hold of them if, if we need them. Rope access technicians are, are famous for uh, their ability to self-rescue. That's one of the things that we really rely on is, is our ability to get ourselves out of any situation that we might be able to get into, or if we're incapa incapacitated, knowing that our partner can get us out of any situation that we've gotten ourselves into. This is, um, this is absolutely key. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't call 911 if something does happen. If something happens, if we do have an incident, um, we do dial 911 because we're, most of us aren't, advanced, uh, aren't uh, trained in advanced medical care. So having medical care available for when we get that person to the ground um, is, is an important part of our job. So, so knowing that, uh, that we have transport and, and what our medical capabilities are nearby, how long it takes them to get there, who it is we're going to call, is part of the, the permit process. That's kind of a, a rough overview of the rope access permit. Uh, developed by SPRAT, which, as I said before, is a membership organization. If you don't like the way that this permit reads or if you don't like the way that this process reads, um, you can get involved in SPRAT and change it and make it the way you want it. Um, the uh, specific regulatory environment that we have in the United States has influenced our permit process. And we've tried to do it through voluntary consensus standards. And those are two standards that exist right there. The Safe Practices for Rope Access Work is a, a voluntary consensus standard written through SPRAT, as is the Certification Requirements document. Both of those documents are available at www.sprat.org. Um, and you can, you can check that out and, and uh, read through those and get to know those a little bit. And like I said, if you, if you don't like them, uh, help us change them and make them the way that you think that they ought to be. SPRAT does offer written as well as practical tests to certify individuals. Anybody who's going to be a technician has to pass both a practical, physical, uh, on-rope test as well as a written certification. You don't have to take a training from any particular individual, although it is highly recommended. It's a lot easier to pass the test if you've recently been trained. And again, we, we do give specific attention to diversity of access needs in the United States. So there's not just one way of doing everything. Uh, it's kind of a, a concept-based uh, approach where you can use any number of actual methods to achieve a goal as long as the, the key safety aspects are, are always provided for. They've heard me call this a permit throughout this whole process. And you know, some people call it a work plan. 
and, and that's okay too. We can call it a work plan, we can call it a permit, we can call it anything you want. I tend to call it a permit because, because that's what our regulatory uh, environment has historically used. That's what OSHA is used for confined space and longshoring and certain other things. And so uh, the permit terminology works for me, but hey, if you'd rather call it something else, you can call it something else. I'd like to thank you all for being here and thank you all for taking the time to listen in today. If you have any questions or anything that you'd like to discuss in further detail, um, Jess is going to get on the line here in a sec and, and uh, take over the screen and she will uh, answer any questions, or not answer, but she'll take any questions that you've written into your chat section and, and ask them of me and, and we can chat about them for a minute. So Je Jess, it's all yours. All right, give me just a second and I will take back the screen here. All right. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat slash questions area of your control panel. Um, and we already have a couple, so um, we're going to go ahead and answer those and just type them in as you get them. So the first question is, I have received questions for or on the redundancy requirements for harnesses. What are your thoughts? By redundancy requirements for harnesses, I'm, I'm supposing that you probably mean um, where OSHA has said in some of their um, their uh, regs that you can't attach two things to the same point on the harness. Um, and and you know we can we can get absolutely ridiculous on this. Um, we we could say that you have to wear two harnesses or that you have to have two guys in a harness or uh, you know we could we could go to the extreme. In rope access, we do tend to use uh, a single attachment point. We do tend to use our sternal attachment point for both the primary and secondary attachment. Now, the reason for that is because um, we're constantly moving from one to the other. From you know, one system is our primary at this moment, but but it might be our backup. Uh, a moment from now. And if in fact we do fall, we don't want to be hang left hanging, dangling from our rear attachment, our dorsal attachment point, because it's very difficult to self-rescue from. Uh, and, and in rope access, as you know, we can't take a, a significant fall anyway, so it's not like we're taking a big whipper on that front attachment point. So, so Yes, you can um, get into some some detail trouble because Sprat has or not Sprat. I'm sorry, uh, OSHA has said in in different documentation that um, you shouldn't attach two things to the same point. Uh, but within Sprat, we do teach that if you want to get around it, you can always attach it to your rear attachment. You can always use your waist attachment for your primary and your sternal attachment for your backup. Um, all of those things are possibilities. Uh, whatever you do, you should probably write that into your permit and say, I did think about this and I am aware of this and here's why I've chosen to do what I'm doing. Okay, and he um, put kind of a side note on it. He said that and the fact that if your harness fails, then is the system really redundant? If your harness fails, um, I'd say you have a much bigger problem than redundancy. Uh, harness failure is just simply not one of those things that um, that we we tend to see ever unless the failure is that of the person choosing not to wear it. That's the biggest harness failure that we that we actually see in in any aspect of fall protection. So so you can you can what if yourself to death and and you can you know you can cocktail napkin yourself out of the the whole business and and I do understand the the concept and philosophy but I think realistically uh, the failure of a harness is such an unrealistic concept um, that that it really is kind of beyond our scope. If however you're uncomfortable and you want to wear two harnesses, I'm sure that that would probably be okay. He said, perfect, that's the answer he was hoping for. <laughs> um, and the next question is, what is being done by Sprat right now to get OSHA on board with rope access? You know, it's, it's not so much a matter of, of Sprat trying to get OSHA on board with rope access. Um, it's really kind of OSHA right now revisiting their fall protection methodologies and uh, trying to make things more practical for the user. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with, with where OSHA is right now as a, uh, an, an organization or as a, as a government entity. Uh, I think they really do, uh, they've kind of looked at 
at the statistics, they've looked at the problems, and they've said, you know, we're doing a lot of work out there, we've written a lot of regulations, we've done a lot for the last 20 years, and hey, look, the, the incident rate isn't decreasing. We need to do something differently. And so they're, they're working not only with SPRAT, but with, with industry organizations uh, across the country to try to make things more practical uh, for the guys who are out there in the field. So, so we're cooperating with them as an organization at SPRAT, and I know many of you are cooperating with, with OSHA as well individually uh, by providing input and, and concepts and ideas. Uh, SPRAT has a, uh, a conference next week. The, the annual conference for SPRAT is in British Columbia uh, next week, and uh, OSHA was invited to speak at that conference but uh, due to, to budget constraints, they were unable to, to take advantage of that opportunity, but they did express their regret uh, at being unable to take advantage of that opportunity. Right after the SPRAT meeting is a hearing in Washington, D.C. for uh, a revisit of the general industry fall protection regulations, and SPRAT will attend that, as will many SPRAT members individually, uh, will also be attending that hearing uh, to speak on behalf of, of work at height and the safety of rope access and uh, to, to vie for inclusion of, of rope access specifically in the fall protection regs. In addition to that, um, we're just maintaining, maintaining an ongoing dialogue uh, to, to try to improve the education and information processes as, as they occur. Okay, and why are there so few safety backup devices used in rope access that meet the ANSI standard for fall arrest? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, the, the biggest issue is that the, the ones that are ANSI certified um, are, they, they kind of have to meet a, a variety of, of test requirements. And some of the test requirements that they have to meet, for example, are uh, they would they have to withstand a six foot fall on a very stiff aircraft cable uh, so fall factor one or two somebody who knows that off the top of their head type it in um, it's it's either a factor one or factor two fall on a really stiff aircraft cable of of at least six feet it's ridiculous it's absolutely absurd. Um, and it's a fall that we simply cannot take in rope access. I don't care how bad you screw up. If you take that kind of a fall and, impact and, and hit with that kind of impact in, in rope access, you're not doing rope access. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're doing, but you're not doing rope access. So the, the test requirements for something that ANSI calls a fall arrest rope grab are so far beyond the scope of, of what we need and what we use um, that it, it just doesn't fit. We're talking apples and oranges. The other thing, or another thing, is that ANSI actually really likes rope, at, rope grabs to be difficult to put on and take off of rope. Um, because if it's difficult to put on, then it's going to be difficult to take off, and you can't accidentally take it off during work. Well, in rope access, we definitely like them to be difficult to take off of the rope because we don't like them to be taken off during work. However, we're constantly switching back and forth between our, our primary and secondary systems. We, we may need to pass knots. We may need to, to switch ropes. We, we know we always have two points of contact no matter what we're doing, um, but being able to while you're hanging in midair with your feet free, uh, with, with one hand, you need to be able to, to get that thing off the rope. And that's just not something that, um, that ANSI really tests for. In fact, they test for just the opposite in their standards. There's a couple of examples. All right, great. Um, if there's any other questions, you can go ahead and type them in right now. Um, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Um, we do have a link, or there will be a link on the link show, on the website shown on your screen to ask Louis a few other questions via email. Um, you can also download the slides from this presentation and watch the live recording of the presentation. Those both will be posted within the next 24 hours. Um, the PMI webinar series hosts a webinar on the first Tuesday of every month. So mark a calendar for February 1st at 12 p.m. and keep an eye on the website for the topic. And if you would like to follow us on Facebook or Twitter, we always post when we have new uh, webinar topics. We also post when we're going to be at trade shows and other fun information. So um, it'd be great if you'd follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And um, thank you guys for 
attending today, and we hope you enjoyed it, and thank you, Louie, for doing it. Great. Thanks very much. All right. Have a great day, everybody.